Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church Gallatin. We'd like to welcome back to our pulpit Rev. Rev. Elizabeth Gilliam. Uh, she's now a familiar face around here, but for those who may not know, Elizabeth is a graduate of Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. She served churches in Ohio, Michigan, and Tennessee, and we're glad to have her back in our pulpit. Well, please be sure and sign the guest book at the end of each pew and pass it down so we'll know who's worshiping with us today. And remember the prayer requests listed in the bulletin regarding our church family. The flowers this morning are dedicated to the glory of God in memory of Prentice Bowes and were given by Tommy and Linda Bowes. And then there's a bulletin insert concerning the annual preschool fall mom sale that they do every year to raise funds for the preschool. And uh, orders are due September 16th and may be picked up September 21st. For those that are interested, the Nakomi retreat is scheduled for September 16th through 18th. And please notify the church office if you plan to attend or if you have any questions about it. Other pending church events are listed in the bulletin and in our weekly newsletter. I wasn't informed if there was a minute for mission. Is anybody? I didn't want to leave them out. Okay, there was no minute for mission this morning. So let us now begin our worship by sharing the peace of Christ with one another. Peace. Welcome. Peace. Peace be with you. Good. Good.
Please stand if you're able and join me for the call to worship. Friends in Christ, come apart from the chaos for a while and linger in the presence of God who is our source of life. God calls us to renew ourselves and to find our lives first. The one who has made us would not have us journey alone. We gather as a sacred community of love together on the quest to know God's hope for our lives and for this church. May we truly seek to live more faithfully as Christ's family, listening to the voice of God in our midst. Please remain standing and join in our hymn on the next page of your bulletin, God is Calling Through the Whisper. Remember, our sins are not to be hidden from God. Rather, we bring them into the light and lay them on the table, trusting in the one who shaped us for goodness and will transform our brokenness into wholeness. Please join me as we pray, saying, Searching God. We try so, so often. We are so attached to our possessions. We have trouble sharing we become so connected to our pleasures that we cannot feel the pain of those around us. We get so stuck on ourselves, we cannot see our neighbor in need. Most merciful God, loosen us from the grip of the world so we can feel your healing touch. Sever us from our sin so your spirit might bind us to you. You shape us, renew us. The God who calls us is the God who created us. The God who formed us is the God who forgives us. This is the good news. We are God's new creation. In the name of Jesus Christ. We are renewed, renewed, forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
divine spirit, surround us with the wisdom of your word that we might dance in your love and be messengers of your truth in this world. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is from Psalms 139, verses 1 through 6, on your pew Bible, in page 710. The word of the Lord. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 14, beginning with verse 25. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to, oppo to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join in the hymn, The Summons, in your bulletin. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother will not be my disciple. Did Jesus really just say that? I would guess that if we took a poll right now 
of all of your favorite Bible verses, this one would not make the cut. I've been ordained for 40 years, and I have managed to avoid preaching on this lection every time it came up. Either focus on the Old Testament, or the epistle, or the beginning of the school year, anything to avoid these words. So I decided it was time to own my own struggle and try to understand what Jesus is trying to tell us today. Understand first that nothing I might say in an effort to come to terms with the language that Jesus is using is meant to lessen the intensity of his words. Choosing to become a disciple of Jesus is an incredibly wonderful, life-changing, difficult, costly decision. The way of life that Jesus offers is not easy. Remember the context of, of these words. There was a great multitude of people walking along with Jesus. There were people in the crowd, I am sure, who were sincere in their desire to, to follow Jesus. There were others that were probably just, just curious or were following the crowd rather than the man. And I'm sure there were some in the crowd that thought Jesus was on his way to restore the kingdom of Israel and destroy all of our enemies. And they wanted to be part of that. In an instant, however, Jesus burst their bubble of ease. He was on his way to Jerusalem, to the cross, to death, to life beyond anything they had ever experienced. He was on his way to restore not the kingdom of Israel, but the kingdom of God. Jesus' words in this scripture are designed to shock the crowds into an understanding of the importance and the cost of following him. So says Jesus, hate your father, hate your mother, hate your wife, hate your children, your brothers, your sister, hate even life itself. And oh yes, while you're at it, give up all of your possessions and then you will be ready to take up your cross and follow me. Really, Jesus? So let's deal with the elephant in the room. That word translated hate. First of all, the hate Jesus speaks of has absolutely nothing to do with the, the angry, emotional, feeling that we associate with that word. It is definitely not the opposite of love. To hate here is 
a Hebrew expression that basically means detach yourself from. Remember that Jesus was speaking in a time when family affiliation was, was everything. Families provided access, security, inheritance rights, a, a way to make a living. Everyone was son of or daughter of. I believe that Jesus is saying that if we wish to be his disciple, then our identity must no longer be son of Paul or, or daughter of Donna, my parents, but rather child of God. In his farewell dis discourse to the disciples in the Gospel according to John, Jesus tells us to be in the world, but not of the world. The kind of hate that Jesus speaks of here is the act of distancing one's self from the entanglements of the world. It is a word about choices and priorities. It's an attitude of, of perspective. It is a word about, about the source of your being, the life itself that you possess, that which drives you and who you are and what you do. I I remember a day many years ago, I was actually sitting at the dining room table in my father's and mother's home, studying for my ordination exams. And my father and my sister were in the adjoining room engaged in one of their, their favorite activities, that of a full-on academic debate. My sister's thesis on that day was that Christians are the least moral people. Whether she actually believed that statement at the time is beside the point, as it often is in this, this kind of debate. But it was important for her to, that, my, that my father accept her thesis, that my father accept the validity of her research, let us say, and, and the, the research, the statements that she was making, the studies that she had looked at. And the, the debate escalated, escalated until my father was almost in tears. And finally he said, I'm sorry, I can't accept your thesis, even in theory, in, in this kind of debate. I cannot accept your thesis because I am a Christian. And if I accept what you are saying, my life is nothing. The claim of God 
is the all of my life. It is who I am. It is what I do. It is what I say. It redefines our lives, our loyalties. It changes all of our perspectives. Like the light of a candle, one small candle, seems like darkness compared to the sun, the light of the sun on a beautiful summer's day. To be my disciple, says Jesus, means to love me with such intensity that compared to that love, everything else seems like hate. But here's the wonderful paradox of discipleship. The more we love Jesus, the more we become like him, the more we think like him, and the more we see people as he sees them, our capacity to love grows. The deeper our love for God becomes, the deeper our love can be for one another. Because our love of God drives our love for our families, our friends, our enemies. It cannot be contained. Says Michael Marsh, no one, no cost, no thing is to take precedence over or interfere with our relationship with God. Nothing is more important because it is our relationship with God that shapes, defines, determines, and characterizes all other relationships, all other aspects of our lives, who we are, and what we say, and what we do. But Jesus isn't finished yet. He continues saying, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Honestly, we have heard so much about crosses and cross bearing in our lives. I think that we tend to be slightly desensitized to what Jesus is saying here. It doesn't give us that, that jolt that the previous statement did, but, but it should. Bearing a cross has nothing to do, like some people suggest, with living with a chronic illness or a painful physical condition or a difficult family relationship. It is instead what we do voluntarily as a consequence of our commitment to Christ. Says Carolyn Lewis, I, it could mean to carry the burdens of those from whom Jesus releases them. It could mean to carry the ministry of Jesus on by truly seeing those whom the world overlooks. To carry your cross is a voluntary 
action, a voluntary choice to take up the burdens and the realities of a life that has made a commitment to bringing about the kingdom of God here and now. Yes, there is a cost to that decision. It is going to take us to some uncomfortable places. It is going to challenge some basic assumptions of our life. It is going to unsettle some of our pet projects. But consider for a moment the cost to the world of non-discipleship. Dallas Willard writes, non-discipleship costs abiding peace. Non-discipleship costs a life penetrated throughout by love. It costs a faith that sees everything in the light of God's overriding love. Non-discipleship costs hopefulness that stands firm even in the most discouraging circumstances. It costs the power to do what is right and withstand the negative forces around us. In short, non-discipleship costs exactly that abundance of life that Jesus came to bring. Discipleship is about who we are and how we live here, now, every day of our lives. It means everything we do, everything we say, everything we choose, our realities of a life lived to reveal the love of God in Jesus Christ. Life that truly matters is before us. The choice is ours to make. And when we fail to make that choice, we choose again and again and again. Choose life. What will you do today to be Christ's disciple and share his love with this hurting world of ours? Amen. Will you stand and will you affirm your faith with me using the words in your bulletin? I put my trust in God. I believe that we live constantly in the presence of an eternal lover whose patience never wearies and whose blessing is inexhaustible. I believe that this world with all its grandeur and beauty, its fertility and fruitfulness, is a gift of the eternal lover whose spirit cherishes and sustains all things. I believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the only authentic child of the eternal lover, and that in his life, death, 
and resurrection, there flows a saving grace which cannot be defeated. I believe that in life and death, this God believes in me, and God's faith shall not be in vain. I put my trust in God. Indeed, God has given us so very, very much, even this wonderful creation of ours. And he has asked us to support us, to support it, to share of our gifts in order that his kingdom may be alive on earth. Let us come before God with our tithes and offerings.
your goodness, we have this money to offer, fruit of our labors and of the skills you have given us. Take us and all that we have to do your work in the world. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread and wine to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us, it becomes the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Grant that these gifts and the offering of ourselves may be made holy and unite us in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They shall come from east and west and from north and south to sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and broke it and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all those who believe in him to share in the feast that he has prepared. May the God of eternal life be with you. In confidence, we draw close to the table of our God. Sing glad songs to the one whose goodness fills our lives. We rejoice that we enter the kingdom of love and hope. You turned to your right and there was nothing there. You went forward and backward and there was only nothingness. And so in your wonder and majesty, you created all that was good and true, O oh God of unparalleled imagination. Your word crafted the living and the active, waterfall, waterfalls carving the sides of mountains, butterflies flitting from flower to flower. Your spirit bubbled with laughter, and the bright morning stars were reflected in cool pools of brimming hope. All these gifts were given to those shaped in your image. But we chose to contend with you, mocking you, making faces at your glory. When it became too hard for us to enter your kingdom on our own, you sent Jesus among us to deliver us from ourselves. So with those who raise their questions to you, with those who struggle with your answers, we lift our voices to you, singing your praises. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of mystery and hope. All creation honors your name. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who calls us to faithful living. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, God of grace and truth. And blessed is Jesus child of wonder. He set aside the treasures of heaven to become one of us so that he, so that we might know the riches of mercy. He let go of the power of glory so that he might know our weakness. He went to the cross on Calvary, committing himself to your love, and it was you who took him from the tomb raising him to new life. As we proclaim his death and resurrection, as we break the bread and drink the cup, we would live out the mystery we call faith. Christ died, having counted the cost. Christ was raised, turning our debt into hope. Christ will come, refreshing our hearts for all eternity. Here at the table graced with your gifts, here upon your children gathered in joy, 
pour out your spirit of peace and life, O oh God, as we come to taste the bread which is in its brokenness makes us whole. We would not go backward to our old life, but go forth to bring hope to all. As we drink deeply from the cup which by its grace fills us with compassion, we would offer the blessings that we have that others might know the richness of your love and hope. And when the age to come has arrived, when our lives are gathered up in your mercy and we are at one with all sisters and brothers from every time and every place, we will join our hearts and voices and sing of your praise through all eternity. God in community, Holy One. Amen. And let us pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this as often as ye drink it, as ye eat it, as in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, our Lord took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's life until he come. Amen. that you take the bread individually as you are served, symbolizing the fact that we are each so special in the eyes of God.
I ask that you hold the cup, and we will take it together after everyone is served, symbolizing the fact that we are one family, one, chill, one family of God, in the name of Jesus. Let us pray together. It is God who has formed us as a community of faith. Now, now may we go to find, serve, and sisters and brothers. It is Jesus who has knit us together as partners in grace. And now may we go to bear the burdens of those around us. It is the Spirit who gives us the words we need. sing our final hymn, Take My Life, and Let It Be.
love of God with all that you meet, and the justice of the kingdom of God will overflow in this world. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.